Welcome, I'm Terry Collins, host and spirit medium of Perfect Pour, the show that takes you around the world of craft beer and spirits. And we want you to join us as we discover, taste, review, and learn about these wonderful beers and spirits. Today we visit the Beer Temple in Chicago for their one year anniversary party. And while there, we get to taste some very interesting craft beers. We'll also sit down with Beer Temple owner, Cicerone, and all around craft beer expert, Chris Quinn. Chris is very passionate and knowledgeable about all things craft beer, and he gets to share some of that with us. We'll also review tasting notes on Teeling Small Batch Irish Whiskey, as well as two expressions of Kilhoman Scotch whiskeys. And we'll finish up with an interesting yet old style of beer called Goza, with the Anderson Valley beer called the Kimmy, the Yink, and the Holy Goza. So join us. Cheers. Terry Collins for Perfect Four. We're at the first year anniversary party for the Beer Temple in Chicago, and I want to take you on an adventure. I just found, where did I find? I found some mint truffle abduction. So I've been abducted. Let's go see what it's about. Wow. Kind of like a liquid Andes mint. Wow. Especially the, the finish right through my nose. Very minty, very chocolatey. I've been abducted. Allagash makes the James Bean. Most known for their Allagash White. So the oak barrel is supposed to be Jim Bean barrel. So they call this one James Bean. Bean for coffee bean. James for Jim Bean. Let's try it. Thank you, Terry. Wow, I've never had a beer that pale have coffee flavor in it. Remarkable. Remarkable. Plenty of flavor. Plenty of coffee flavor. And I get some of the, the barrel age too, some of the, uh, it is an ale. Allagash makes Belgian, so I'm not sure if they use a Belgian ale yeast for this, which I can see them doing. And you can also see because of the foam, it's quite a foamy beer. Yeah. I think that's why I put it on there. That has to be a bathroom. Three Floyds, permanent funeral. I'm not sure I've heard of this one before, quite hoppy. Rather cold. Very hoppy. So we're out here, it's a cold Chicago day. We've got some coffee to warm me up. Some perennial sumptive vanilla, which is a coffee, imperial coffee stout, from perennial out of St. Louis. And this is like a shot of espresso with some vanilla and stout, and it's just gorgeous. The mouthfeel is mm, chocolate milk, espresso, vanilla, remarkable. Nothing like it to warm me up on a cold day. It's perfect, perfect pour. So in the course of my wanderings, I happened upon a beer that I've been searching for for a while. The Hills Farm said Double Citra IPA, which I believe was rated the highest beer, had the highest score on the Beer Advocate website. I have not yet tried it. It's from Vermont, or is it New Hampshire? One of those places. And I've been waiting to try this for a long time. You're going to see it right here on Perfect Four. My first taste of Hills Farm said. I'm speechless. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's remarkably hoppy. Uh, there's a blend of hops in there. There's definitely some Simcoe. All you Surly fans will certainly get a kick out of this and then some. Very citrusy. Very nice. I think it's great. I love I love you the like Floyd. It? They make great beer. And you like hops, apparently. I love hops. I do. Yeah. You can't go wrong with hops. More hops are best. I love that beer, too. This one is very interesting. It's another direction from the hoppiness. The tanginess in the Belgian style comes from the yeast instead of the hops. 
and this one is very tangy. It's got a very long taste. Tip of my tongue all the way down. I can taste this beer. Whereas with the hoppy beers, right up front you get the nose. This one's got a very nice nose from Three Floyd. Oh yeah. Very nice. Oh. We've got the, we stumbled on the Goose Island Proprietors Bourbon County series, their stout. Uh, this is a historic, uh, not historic, but a cult beer. It's one of the ones that people line up for limited release, about 14% ABV. And you can tell that this has been married to the bourbon barrel for quite some time. It is. Well, the way they did the perennial one, the epitome of the rum raisin experience with beers. You get flavors beyond rum and raisin. You get coconut, uh, German chocolate cake. Even at this temperature, it's just a little cold. It's just an explosion of flavors. Creaminess, smooth. You definitely get the sense that it has been around bourbon because you get vanilla as well. The nose is just amazing. And as I'm warming it in my hands, the flavors come through even more. The creaminess, the sense that it's almost like there's bourbon added to the beer. And that's what the long maturation in those bourbon barrels will do for this. This is a sipper. The double daisy. I had never tried it before and I never heard it. And I'm a big Cat Baker fan. I don't know how I missed it, but it is delicious. Uh, it's, I think, maybe my new favorite beer. I like the Three Floyds Permanent Funeral. Um, I've had it before, but uh, it's kind of hard to get your hands on, so it's good to try it again today. I drink almost exclusively IPAs, but one thing that being here today reminded me of is that I really like Porter, so now I'm going to go back to my local bars and order Porters. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's funny, actually Porters are my favorite, but I'm pretty much open to try all kinds of beer, and um, what I found today is that I had a lot of sour beers that I've been enjoying, and that's not something I drink as frequently. One of the great things we get to do here on Perfect Pour, of course, is try a lot of new and different things. And we have one tonight, Teeling's Small Batch Irish Whiskey from Dublin. Now there's not actually a distillery in Dublin, but Jack Teeling is setting one up. And in the meantime, he's sourcing his whiskey, his uh, stash of alcohol from Cooley, which was started by his father, John, in the 1980s. Cooley was bought out by Jim Beam in 2011 or 2012 and subsequently bought out by Suntory of Japan or earlier this year, in fact. And uh, that has sort of led to the realization that there isn't a lot of craft in Irish whiskey. And so Teeling, uh, Jack Teeling, is trying to remedy that by starting up the first new distillery in Dublin, actually the first new distillery in Dublin in 100, over 100 years. And Jack Teeling has done a couple of remarkable things with his small batch Irish whiskey. The first is that it comes in at overproof. Most Irish whiskeys are 40%. Teeling's is 46%. So with that extra alcohol content, you get more flavor. There's less water. The other thing is that as opposed to most other Irish whiskeys or all other Irish whiskeys, as far as I know, that are matured in bourbon and sherry casks, this spends six months of its life maturing in rum casks. And that puts a very different spin on Irish whiskey, unlike any other Irish whiskey that I've ever had. And we have some tasting notes that we've done previously. And we always start by pouring a glass and sniffing, which I like to do. You get a very different character from it, with and without water. We start without water, of course. Smell and taste uses our senses as much as possible, and even sight. You can see this is very pale, non-chill filtered, no artificial color added. And the nose, to start with, is sweet, and that comes from the rum casks. There's also a muskiness, which you might expect from something that's aged. Uh, there's a savory note to it as well, 
And there's something I get from most scotches and bourbons, but I don't hear people talk about very much, is a sort of ammonia smell, almost like Windex. And as you swirl it, that goes away and the other notes come through, especially the sweetness. And I would expect that from something aged in rum barrels. And what we also do is smell without water and taste without water because uh, whiskeys are very dynamic creatures. They're very different with and without water. Some people like them straight uh, or neat, and some people like them with water. Um, I like to open it up with water, but I always start out just pure out of the bottle. And for our tasting notes out of the bottle, it's, it's young, it's sharp, it's got some heat to it, uh, but it's silky, and I think that's a result of the non-chill filtering. Um, there's a grain coming through, a graininess to it, like uh, matured, um, I almost consider it like um, uh, I don't want to say rotting grain, but there's grain involved in the production of, of whiskey, and it certainly comes through in this very strongly. Uh, there's a medium finish with, with some burn, uh, and that's also part of the overproof nature. And then the sweetness comes through. You really do get the sweetness from this, and it really comes out both in the nose and in the taste when you add water to it. A teaspoon or two to something of this strength is just about right for a dram. And at that point, you get a really different character. The ammonia goes away, the sweetness comes through, you get the smell of, of pears and fruit, some honey, uh, sugar notes, which is really coming from the rum maturation. Uh, the taste sweetens, the heat goes away somewhat. Uh, there's a ripe pear and confectionery sugar taste, which is very different from the syrupy taste of a lot of other Irish whiskeys. And that syrupy taste, along with the lower um, alcohol content of typical Irish whiskeys, makes them really great for doing shots and for mixed drinks. But this is a whiskey that's got more going for it. The overproof nature of it and the rum finish makes it something that you can actually spend time with, uh, sip, think about, get the full range of flavor. It's not just something for the tip of your tongue. You get some a sensation all the way down. You get the nose, which comes up right through your nostrils. It's a very full and, and wonderful thing. It's very different from other Irish whiskey. So I think it's worth searching out, worth spending some time with, and it's something that's very different and is just perfect for perfect pour. Terry Collins here for Perfect Pour, the art of craft beer and spirits. And I'm here with my guest today, Chris Quinn, the Beer Temple in Chicago. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, Terry. Chris just celebrated his one-year anniversary at the Craft Beer Temple, and I'm here to find out how things have gone. Things have been going amazingly well. I could not have ever imagined when I first opened this store that things would have gone the way they did. Just the amount of support and the general desire for people to want to try new and interesting beers and learn more about craft beer has just been really amazing. Well, basically I thought that craft beer had come to a point where it needed its own store, it needed its own outlet. I felt that, um, you know, these craft breweries, these artisans had been making these really great world-class beers and there just was not an outlet for them that really expressed what had gone into the bottle. Um, a lot of these brewers are putting their heart and soul and really pressing the limits of what can be done with beer these days. And then they're just going and sitting in, you know, just a, an average liquor store and not being cared for the proper way. And maybe not even, there's just the level of education isn't there. So people who go in and pick up the beer don't know what they're drinking. And, you know, sometimes you need to know what you're drinking in order to appreciate it. it certainly helps. Yeah. So kind of that is what I, I wanted to do. I wanted to create a, a craft beer boutique, something that really catered to beer specifically and to caring for beer and presenting the beer to the final customer the way the brewers intended them to be drunk. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what craft beer is or isn't. There's some formal uh, definitions of craft beer based on ingredients and how many how much you make to me really craft beer is really just the spirit of what's what's in the bottle uh, are you using just quality ingredients are you making a 
a world-class product? Are you making beer that really is, is special? And is it not just a mass-produced, manufactured um, beverage, really? It's, it's really what was the intent of the beer rather than does it fit within this specific category? It's what was the intention of this beer? And is it meant to be a great beer to be enjoyed on its own? Yes. Is it meant to be, you know, slugged down ice cold so you can't taste it? No, maybe that's not as much a craft beer then. I think a lot of the German lagers are absolutely, absolutely. world class. And, you know, they are made on, on big scale at some point, but they use the absolute best ingredients. They use the finest malts in the world. They use absolutely wonderful German hops and they're cared for. And there's just such a sense of tradition yes, there. Exactly. Yeah. And that to me is absolutely a craft product. Although some people would say that isn't, but to me, I mean, if listen, I mean, if you want to drink a, a lager, and you want to drink a really great one, I'm going to direct you towards the Germans because to me, they make the best lagers. The style. Yeah, they make the best lagers in the world. Call it craft or not. It's an excellent, well-made product. So that's what I would consider to be, uh, you know, a big brewery making a, a craft product. The Americans are definitely pushing the envelope and just pushing styles, creating new styles, experimenting with anything and everything that has to do with sure. beer. Yeah, uh, I think it's kind of cool. And I think it really stems from the fact that for so long there was so little choice here in America. And now that they're, they realize that there is more to beer than just macro lager, well, let's just try everything. So we are really, the, the leaders right now globally in um, just new beers and, and trying new things. I, I think that really we're nowhere near the limit yet. I think eventually, yeah, there will be saturation. You can't grow at this astronomical rate forever. I also think people talk about a bubble forming sometimes. I don't necessarily see it as a bubble. I think some of these breweries that are starting up now are not gonna make it. I just think that's that's natural. That's how it's supposed to be. Uh, but I do, don't do think that it's because we've reached some sort of ceiling or threshold. I think we're still a ways away from that. Craft beer is still fairly small in the overall scheme of things. Sure yeah. I think I heard something like 8% even at this point. Yeah. For the, for, at least for the American market. Yeah, by volume it's yeah. about, it's right around there. So they're trying to get up a little higher. Right now, America is driving the, the, really driving the craft beer movement globally. And for the first time really ever, the brewers from all over the world are looking towards Americans to see what, what we're doing. I was recently in England and it was really interesting to see this new breed of craft brewer there where they have their traditional brewers who are doing the traditional styles in the traditional way. And then there's this younger generation coming up who are doing these traditional British beers, but they're doing the Americanized versions of them because a lot of the most popular beers that are in the craft beer scene, the IPAs, the stouts, the porters, those are all British beers. Right. So you have these British brewers brewing the uh, their traditional styles in the American form, let's call it, but then tweaking it and remaking it British in a way. It's very cyclical. It's really kind of cool to see this kind of, I don't know, us influencing a traditional, a traditional yeah. brewing powerhouse. Very, very exciting times. Yeah.